Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the iMakey LEV webinar, Extracting Best Practice. My name is Ian Birkinshaw, and I am the General Secretary of Sharper, the Solids Handling and Processing Association, and also a member of the iMakey Bulk Handling Committee. During the presentation, if you wish to ask a question, please use the Ask, ask the Question pod on the right-hand side of your screen. And may I take the opportunity to introduce our presenter, Adrian Sims. Adrian Sims is the Managing Director of Ventec Limited. Adrian is a building service engineer with over 25 years experience in the industry as consultant and contractor specialising in the design of mechanical building service systems. He has spent over 20 years as Managing Director of Ventec Limited, managing a team of over 12 people carrying out the design, installation, testing and commissioning of specialist local exhaust ventilation systems. Before this, he spent several years working for an industrial centrifugal fan manufacturer. He has designed and commissioned many bespoke systems to control hazardous substances, handling in a number of sectors, as well as working as a consultant. He is also Vice Chair of the Institute of the Local Exhaust Ventilation Engineers, Chair of the Industry and Regulatory Forum on Local Exhaust Ventilation Competency, and a Council Member for the Building Engineering and Services Association. So over to Adrian now for his presentation. Hi, my name is Adrian Sims. Uh, I'm here today to talk to you guys about local exhaust ventilation systems. Um, just a quick bit of background about myself. I'm currently vice chair of the Institute of LEV Engineers. Uh, I also lecture on LEV subjects such as design, testing, commissioning of systems. And I also am uh, MD of Ventec Limited, um, who design, test, install, commission LEV systems. So our first thing to do is to look at the requirement of why we need LEV systems. Cost Regulation 7 uh, looks at the hierarchy of control. It says that engineering controls, i.e. LEV, must be employed prior to the use of PPE. So why is this a requirement? When we look at the statistics, they clearly show there's a massive issue for more and improved control measures within the industry. The numbers of people being made ill in the UK each year from exposure to hazardous substances is staggering and continues to grow. To put this into context, when we look at air crashes worldwide, approximately 1.2 people per day are killed. We look at deaths on roads in the UK, we're looking at about 4.6, 4.7 people a day are killed. And if you look at terrorism, 36 people a day, that's the equivalent to the Brussels terrorist attack every single day. And the numbers are just staggering. If we look at the cost of the country, it's something like £9 billion pounds a year um, due to people being off work uh, through ill health and the, the impact that has on the economy. Every day, we see obvious processes where engineering controls should be implemented, but they're not. We also see thousands that have uh, LEV systems that are completely inadequate and operators and employers are exposed both physically and legally to hazardous substances. Now some of these substances are quite exotic and, and quite rare but others are everyday uh, occurrences and I'm going to run through a bit of a case study on flour. So here uh, we have a, a lady tipping flour into a mixer Now, if we look at the HSE document EH40 this gives us a, a workplace exposure limit for flour of around 10 or of 10 milligrams per meter cubed and a short term exposure limit of 15 uh, over a 15 minute period of 30 milligrams per meter cubed. Now, a common misconception is that the well is a safe level. Unfortunately, it's not. A well is a point when the average person starts to fall ill. So who's average? If you control to the well, you only protect 50% of the population. But what about the other 50%? Do we know how much dust 10 milligrams is? So if we take a teaspoon, that holds about 4 milligrams of flour. 
So here, just show you what four milligrams looks like. Let's zero the scales. We get a spoonful of flour. So there's four grams of flour. Now what we can do, we can divide that up and we can we split it into two first of all. Right there. So we now have two piles of two grams. Get rid of one of them. We can split this pile down further. So now we have one gram. Let's tidy that up. We can split that down again. And we'll split it into, into two to give us half a gram or 500 milligrams. Remember, we're looking for 10 milligrams so we need to split this pile split it into four so we've now got piles of 125 milligrams or approximate get rid of three of them And we can split this down again. You don't want to sneeze when you're doing this test, this experiment, rather. So five piles, 25 milligrams each. And now all we've got to do is split this last one And eventually we're going to get our pile of 10 milligrams. It's not a lot. It's quite a small amount, isn't it? You can see it's almost just enough dust to cover your, your little fingernail. So, and here it is up against a penny piece. So when we look at the lady in the photo, how much do we think she's exposed to? Well, doing some air monitoring, it was discovered that she was exposed to 100 milligrams of per meter cubed of flour over an eight hour day. Now she does this task five days a week and done it for many years. And okay, she's wearing a mask. She only put the mask on because we were there with a clipboard doing the study. Up until that point, the mask was around her chin. So we need to put some engineering controls in place. But who are you going to go to for that? Well, you need to find a provider who's going to come up with a solution for you that's going to work. How do you find the provider? Do you What do you look for? Do you look at their website? Do you look for experience? Do you look for similar projects? It's tough. You know, we hear people come in and say, you know, I've been doing this for X number of years. If everyone who says this actually knew what they were doing, we wouldn't be killing 36 people a day. This is all. We've got to stop saying this. I've been doing it for years. I know what I'm doing. We've got to look for competent people. But who's responsible for those people? And who's responsible for the effectiveness of the LEV system? There is guidance out there. 
There's a document called TR40, which is jointly badged between iLevy and Biza, the Building Services, uh, so Building Engineering Services Association, which details the roles and responsibilities for those involved in buying, providing, testing, and running of LEV systems. And if you're buying systems or using systems, it's well worth getting yourself a copy. HSE document, HSG 258, says an employer should be competent for health and safety purposes or employ or obtain advice from competent people. Then the cost regulations require that employers ensure any person, whether or not their employee, who carries out work in connection with the employer's duties under the cost regulations has suitable and sufficient information, instruction and training. Employers ensure whoever provides advice on the prevention or control of exposure is competent to do so. Whoever designs control measures needs appropriate knowledge, skills and experience. And anyone who checks on the effectiveness of any element of control measure should be competent to do so. So there's a huge responsibility on the employer to ensure that the advice they're getting and the people they're using are competent to do the role. So what is competence? How does the employer, who's an expert, expert in their field, and probably not in LEV, select a competent provider? You can refer to HSE guidance documents, such as the COSH ACOP L5, HSG 258, or INDG 408. All very useful, all freely available off the internet. Or you can ask proof of competency from an independent professional organization, such as the Institute of LEV Engineers. Or you can ask to see someone's professional qualifications in the relevant subject. But remember, competency is a combination of qualification and relevant experience. A competent person will not mind you asking them to provide proof of competency. So you found a competent provider. What are you going to ask your chosen provider to do for you? What guarantee do you want? Is it to move X amount of air? Is it to supply a fan of a certain size or kilowatt rating? Or is it to provide a number of hoods or arms or whatever you want to call them? You need some guarantee. And that guarantee has to be to reduce the hazardous substance to a safe level. Now the Kosh ACOP says that control measures must be proportionate to the health effect. And that the wells should not be considered a hard and fast line between safe and unsafe. And where substances are atomogens or carcinogens, that exposure must be reduced to as low as reasonably practical, or a LARP, as we call it. When we look at safe levels, we refer to the well, or workplace exposure limit, and that it's not a safe limit. We know levels of exposure, once have agreed to a safe level of control, we normally work to one-tenth of the well. Then we can, once we've got that, we can establish the type of hood required and what reduction factor that will give us to reduce the uh, exposure to the hazardous substance. How do we prove this guarantee? We do air monitoring. We do air monitoring before the control measures in place to establish what the exposure levels are. You can do it um, as a desktop study. It's not as accurate um, and there will always be uh, additional um, measures put in place, either higher air volumes or, or additional controls to over-engineer it a bit if you do a desktop study. So getting actual numbers, actual recorded levels is always better. And once we put the controls in place, we then redo the air monitoring to prove that control effectiveness. So we have a before and we have an after reading. So when we look at our flower dust example, the lady in the photo was exposed to 100 milligrams per cubic meter. The well is just 10 milligrams per cubic meter. And we're gonna control that to one tenth because we don't know if she's average or not average. You know, you, there's no way of telling. It's all in their DNA uh, makeup. So we have to, protect as many people as we can. So we always move the line to the left to reduce the exposure down. And we work on a factor of one tenth. 
And that's quite common in the LEV industry. So that gives a reduction factor of 100 milligrams per meter cubed in the air down to an exposure level of one milligram. So we're looking for a reduction factor from our LEV system of 100. Now we can use figure nine from HSG 258. And if we draw a line across uh, where it says 100, we can see the type of hood it will give us that level of control. Now, I prefer to use the Australian version of this. Basically, it's the same table, but it's colored in, it's easier to see. In this instance, to get you know that reduction factor of 100, we're gonna have to use something like a downflow um, table or a walk-in booth or a partial enclosure or an almost full enclosure. Now we need to look at the application um, that we're looking to control and on the, the particular mixer, if we were to install downflow, we could connect up this duct spigot here and put some extraction through it. And what that will do, that will cause air to come in through the opening here, and that will contain that dust cloud. It'll pull that dust cloud back down and into the bowl. And the bowl itself also acts as a partial enclosure. And that would protect the lady's breathing zone. We have to consider the rest of the system as well. And there are many, many features that need to be considered by the designer of the LEV system. Some critical factors include the number and the size of the hoods on the system, the position of the hoods, the length of the ducting runs, the fan and filter lo plant location, discharge arrangements, makeup ar arrangements. Um, if any of those elements change, we have to redesign the system because they are critical. You have other considerations to take into account. The ergonomics, uh, you know, the user's got to be able to use the system. We've got to take into account noise. These plants are noisy. The two you see in the photo there, when they pulse clean, you get a, a, a noise level of about 102 decibels. If you're running at night, you will get complaints from neighbors. We've got to consider the structural loadings, uh, not just the weight of the ducting and that, but you know the loading on stacks uh wind loading on stacks and things electrical controls and the power consumption how are people going to turn it on off is it easy for them to turn it on off is it interlocked with the machine and also with things like flower dust uh, and wood and, and various other materials we are considered the zero regulations the, what we don't want to do is, is suck all this dust away put it into a filter plant and then have an explosive atmosphere there so we need to control that so it's important that you sit down with the designer and the user of the LEV system at an early stage of the design process so you can accurately specify what is required. And this will eliminate expensive changes later in the process. When we look at the installation, LEV systems are not just a ducting exercise. There's a lot more to it. They can be complex systems that, if they're installed incorrectly, will not perform as designed and therefore will provide will not provide the adequate control uh, or protection required. You should look for uh, contacts that are members of professional organizations such as the Building and Engineering Services Association and ensure that they hold relevant safety accreditations. Once a system is installed, it needs to be commissioned prior to it being used. Unfortunately, commissioning is often overlooked, either due to the urgency of the system being in use or that the prime you know, the LEV provider just doesn't understand what they need to do uh, to commission the system. So let's look at what is commissioning. What does it involve? And why do we do it? The legal requirement for commissioning is with the provision and use of work regulations, uh, work equipment regulations uh, or pure regs. As LEV equipment can be described as work equipment, pure regulation four applies, which states that uh, the, the, the system should be suitable for the purpose for which it is used or provided. Uh, any additional risk posed by the use of the equipment is taken into account and dealt with. And under the conditions, uh, the employer shall ensure that work equipment is used only for operations and under conditions for which it is suitable. And when they say suitable, it also includes any reasonably foreseeable effects, uh, the health and safety of the person. So, when we say suitable, it's got to take into account 
dirty filters. When we design systems, we don't design them to run on clean filters because a clean filter isn't clean for very long. It's going to get dirty. So it's foreseeable that, that filter will get dirty. The Pure Regs also states that the systems must be maintained and users must be trained on how to operate them. When we say the system works, we mean it provides adequate control to do hazardous substance. And we also specify to what level. It's not just a case of switching it on and off. In some instances, you may have to use PPE or other controls such as dilution ventilation um, in conjunction with the LEV to provide that adequate control. And the LEV is just one part of the overall control solution. Typical example of this, welding fume. Welding fume is very toxic. Uh, the welder will almost certainly have to wear uh, RPE, um, usually an air-fed helmet. You must have dilution ventilation under the building regs, um, so that must be in there as well. That will help control some of the residual fume, but the bulk of the fume will be controlled by the LEV. So you need three levels of control, the PPE or RPE for the, the, the welder. You need the LEV control to stop the bulk of the fume being released into the environment, and you need some general dilution ventilation to control any uh, fugitive emissions you may get. So you have a control solution, not just a single LEV control or PPE or dilution. So how do we check control? As part of the commissioning, we're gonna do several checks. First of all, we're gonna check that everything has been installed in accordance with the design. Once we're happy and satisfied with that, we will then move on and we'll undertake what's called uh, uh, qualitative uh, controls, uh, uh, tests. So we'll do smoke test or use a dust lamp. And we we'll re release smoke in a, near the hood to prove its control effectiveness. We may use a dust lamp to see if there's any dust released into the working environment. And we may do air monitoring, either static or personal monitoring um, to see the exposure levels um, that are being released into the air. Smoke is really useful to us. We use smoke for all sorts of things when we're checking the system. Here we're using it for checking for leaks on the ducting and on the fan. If you look closely at the video, you may see the, the smoke coming out through the top of the fan. And we can use it on discharge stacks to make sure there's no recirculation. You spent all this money to get a system to take the fumes away. The last thing you want it to do is just to come back in through any open doors or windows. So we need to ensure that the discharge arrangements are, are working well. The third stage of the commissioning is we take all our measurements. We measure all the velocities and all the pressures through the system. Now, they're important to us as engineers um, because we can relate to them and refer to them in future years when we do our future tests. They don't mean very much to the user of the system uh, or the owner of the system. Um, they're, they're more of a, a, an engineering or a techie thing for us to relate to to see if there's any drop off in performance and help us to track any uh, any problems with the system. Once we're happy with all the numbers we're getting and we're happy with our uh, quality of assessments, we then set the benchmarks. Now the benchmarks are used uh, for the management and maintenance of the LEV system for the uh, subsequent thorough examination and testing. The LEV commissioning report together with the user manual, is the basis of the statutory annual thorough examination test. And many LEV systems will have been commissioned or would not have been commissioned or supplied with any user manual. In these cases, the employer will have little information on the required performance or how to maintain that system. They must have that information to enable the efficient, safe use of the system. Now, none of this is new. Been around for a long time. HSD 258 has been de been around detailing this since at least 2008. And there's other guidance before before then. And I reiterate, together with the logbook, the user manual commissioning document all forms part of that essential set of documents you should have with your LEV system. And that's, that doesn't matter whether it's uh, a, 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 you know thousands of pounds worth of a, a fixed system or something you've bought off the shelf or off the internet. They all should have those set of documents. 
This is the statement the Commission report should contain. And for any client to accept the LEV system, if it doesn't have this statement, you don't have control, you're potentially at risk. The report should also be signed, or it, should also be, it, must, it must be signed by the commissioning engineer. So you have your new system, it works, you've got a piece of paper telling you so, great. But what about the servicing? You've got to look after these things. It's a legal requirement. Cost Regulation 9 says that every employer must ensure that all controls are maintained in an efficient state, efficient working order, good repair and clean condition. Often clients assume they are covered under warranty. Whilst this is true for components that fail due to poor manufacture, like any mechanical piece of equipment, you know, for example, a car, you know, the, the plant is starting to fail the moment you turn it on. Systems need to be regularly checked and serviced in line with their manufacturer's instructions. Otherwise, the warranty will come null and void. More importantly, the system needs to be looked after to ensure control of the hazardous substance is maintained. A typical maintenance contract will involve three or four visits a year, mostly for basic checks, uh, but at least once a year for a full system clean down and overhaul of the belts and uh, filters to, to keep it working in its optimum condition. And then finally, we have our testing, uh, often referred to as the annual test uh, or, or LEV test or COSH test. People call it all sorts of things. But it's not always an annual test. Again, the law is quite clear on this. It does say most systems need to test it at least once in a 14 month period. But it also says, unless they appear on schedule four. So what is schedule four? This is schedule four. And most of these cases here apply to foundries. However, if we look at this one here, it refers to the use of angle grinders or polishing, um, or, where, where working metal components. And this is typically all fabrication shops. And this is due to the abrasive nature of the dust being handled. They need to be checked more often, at least once every six months. But in our experience, this is hardly ever done. So you've selected a competent LEV tester and they're about to start work. But before they do, they need to have some information from the employer. They need to have the commissioning report. They need to have the user manual. They need to have the logbook, any previous reports, and a confirmation that there's been no changes since the commissioning has been carried out. If there have been changes, such as additional ducts or hoods, changes to the hoods, new fan or motor, or changes to the process, changes to the hazardous substance being controlled, then the system needs to be recommissioned. Now that does sound quite onerous, it may not be. If you've had the system properly designed in the first place, it may be a simple check. It may be a just a phone call or an email to say, hi guys, we're gonna use this substance. Is the LEV still okay for that? It may be that, you know, if you've changed hoods, you've changed the layout, that they need to retake some readings and then prove the control effectiveness again, okay? But once you've done that, you get reissued a new commissioning certificate and away you go. When the tests are carried out, the com big complaint is that they're not done thoroughly. It is a thorough examination and test. These are normally carried out in three stages. First one is a thorough visual examination to verify the LEVs in efficient working order, good repair and clean condition. You're looking for dents and damages and holes in filters and checking to see if the operators are using it properly, um, flexible hoses aren't crushed, that sort of thing. You might even do your smoke tests um, as part of your visual examination. Secondly, you're gonna measure all your pressures and your flow rates, look at the technical performance of the system, and then confirm it's doing what it was doing when it was commissioned. And if there are any changes, why is that? What might be causing those changes? And then finally, you do an assessment to check the control of the rookie exposure is adequate. Again, that might be a smoke test, it might be an observation, um, but you need to say in that test that adequate control will be achieved. Now the text requires a lot of 
of information to be gathered and documented. And there's a list of this found in HSG 258. And the report document will run into several pages. Now, a lot of that information, as the owner of a system, you don't really need. Um, it, it's, but you do need the executive summary. You do need to know if there's any issues. And a good practice would be to put that on the front page. The, the pressures in the system, the flow rates, the, the velocities, they're not really an issue uh, to you unless they're not right. And that should be within the executive summary. And if you're inquisitive and want to know a bit more about these, there is a template which the Institute of LEV Engineers has produced, and that's freely available off their website for anyone to access and anyone to use. Uh, so there's no excuses why LEV providers are, are providing substandard uh, reports. Within the report, uh, you should have uh, diagrams of the system, uh, a layout schematic, typically, and you should have photographs of the system. Um, any issues, any findings, anything they're concerned about, uh, anything they want to comment on, there should be a photograph and that should be labelled accordingly. And anything they find should be in the executive summary. The most important thing that every report should have is the signature of the person who's carried out the examination. They are saying that that system is safe to use. Okay, It's going to protect someone from being exposed to something that's going to give them cancer or asthma. So it's a pretty critical thing. Without the signature, the report isn't worth the paper it's written on. It's a legal document and it is evidence for the employer to say that the that you know, that piece of critical safety equipment that prevents someone from potentially losing their life is working. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you, Adrian. Um, uh, we have a few questions. Um, first question that sort of popped up is, where can I find guidance about the exhaust stack velocity for an, uh, an, an LAV system? Okay, um, so discharge velocities from stacks are made up of a number of things in the air. It's not just um, the rise due to momentum, which is the velocity, it's the rise due to buoyancy, of the uh, gases you emit, the um, physical stack height as well makes up part of it, and you then get what's known as wake downwash. Uh, this is the, the wind coming around the stack causes turbulence and it drags the fumes back down. So you need to take all things into consideration when you're designing stack discharge velocities. Uh, the British Occupational Hygiene Society course P602 looks at design of stacks. That's what I would recommend um, for a portal call. Uh, there's very little other guidance out there on stack discharge velocities. There is some information in the Environment Agency the documentation for an one at one time, uh, but you can still get hold of them via the, the British Library. Uh, there is another, there's an American document out there um, from the um, American Conference of Government Industrial Hygienists, or ACGIH, uh, that has some information on stack discharge velocities as well. Uh, in, but you'd have to buy that it's from the states. Uh, it costs about two hundred dollars, um, so you can you can get that as well. Okay, thanks, Adrian. Um, the next question is: When designing a system for a facility that is not yet being built, so measurements aren't possible, is there a role for simulation CFD? Or do you always use hand calcs, experience, rule of thumb, etc.? This question applies both to extract considerations and to recirculation systems. So, so we don't use rule of thumb. Um, that's we're, we're beyond that. I like to think um, CFD. Uh, CFD gives you a pretty picture if you've got all your information, your inputs correct. And it's usually quite difficult to get them all correct because you've got to create the environment. And it doesn't take into account operatives and what they do. When we look at processes, you have to break down um, 
to the individual process. You can quite often see similar processes or the exact same process in uh, the existing facilities. Where they're not built, uh, you can do benchmarking, exposure benchmarking, to estimate a operative's potential exposure to a substance from a process. So that is what we would normally do. Um, that is something you work through by hand. Uh, again, the P602 design course covers that uh, and, and that process. Once you have that information, you can then look at your reduction factors from there and then you design of hoods. But we certainly don't just do rule of thumb um, and say CFD, it's, it's not quite there to, to give you an accurate um, assessment of what's needed for, for controlling hazardous substances. Okay, thanks, Adrian. Um, next question is, what is the best practice for examiners adding labels to LEV equipment um, in brackets visible to operators? So currently, that's, that's quite vague. Um, it's a good question. The, the HSE require all hoods to have a pass or a fail sticker on them, a bit like a PAT test sticker on an electrical item. They, they should be visible. Um, where you're dealing with a lot of hoods, they can be quite big and they can be up in the air and out of the way. We also tend to put them on the on-off button. So if you've got a system that's failed, you put a red sticker on the, the on-off button, so hopefully people don't use it. There, there are a number of people in the industry who are currently looking to improve what we do in terms of stickers uh, and labeling for hoods. We're, we're a long way behind the building services industry um, with our, our information we provide on LEV systems. One of the things we've been pushing for for a number of years is, is flow arrows on, on the ducting, which you can get yellow and black ones which say hazardous air. Uh, it's my opinion that they should be put on all systems. So people who are working on or near the system are aware that you know, the, the contents of that duct is potentially harmful to health. The, the hoods should have labels on them telling operators what good looks like. So if you've got something like a capture hood, which is typically what you have on your, your welding hood, it needs to have something like the capture distance, uh, what is the working zone, um, where that should be, how the hood should be positioned. If you've got fume cupboards, you should have um, sash operating height stickers, uh, maximum minimum. Um, if you, uh, i trying to think what you would have on the hoods. If you have gauges on hoods, so airflow indication devices, maybe a, a magnetic pressure gauge or a, a, a monitor unit, something like that. If it's a, a pressure gauge, you need to have that labeled with red and green zones to show when it's in a safe operating zone. Okay. If you've got filters, filter plant, uh, filters should have the clean and dirty pressures labeled on them so people know when to change them. But that's only useful if you have a, a gauge across the filter as well. Okay, thanks, Adrian. Um, next question, and this is more of a general question. Um, as a ratio, um, how many installations that your engineers visit require improvement, and what is the main cause of failure of those systems? If I had to, if I had to work out a figure, I would say probably 80 to 90% of systems fail. Um, the reason they fail is uh, there's a couple of key reasons. Um, one is poor purchasing, and that's that's not a dig at any anyone in particular, but people don't tend to understand what the LEV needs to do. Um, they they want something, they they buy something that sucks. They're quite often sold something um, that does move some airflow, but it doesn't provide that adequate control. And when we look at the 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 amount of dust or fumes that are in the air that can cause harm, and, and that's why I did the little thing with the weighing scales, it doesn't need very much um, contaminant to be in the air to cause someone harm. A lot of LEV systems just aren't up to the job. They're bought out of catalogs or off the internet or off you know, salespersons 
who don't do the benchmarking, don't understand the, the full risk. Um, and then when we come along to test them, unfortunately, we have to give the good news that it's not quite working. The other main cause of failures are lack of maintenance. Uh, quite often we'll go places and filters are clogged, uh, and blocked or bins are full up. And lack of user training, operatives not being shown how to use systems properly, why is it important to, to use the system, where are the working zones compared to the capture zones, things like that. Very, very basic stuff. And when we explain it to people and show them it's it's quite, they get they get it. Um, but unfortunately, because we live in an age when we just buy stuff off the internet or, or you know, from sales guys or from contractors who don't quite understand what they're doing, a lot of the time you don't have that adequate control and that's, and that's why they fail. Okay, you, um, uh, another question for you, Adrian. Um, are there any significant modifications that need to be considered when designing LEV for the marine environment, i.e. on Navy vessels? Um, yes, yes, there are there are some sort of specifics around um, around um, LEVs on boats. Uh, corrosion is a big problem. Obviously, you, you're out at sea, you've got salt water. That that is an issue. So you, you tend to have um, systems made up with the predominantly out of stainless steel. The other issue is the voltage on the fans. Um, not all ships have 240 volts or three phase power supplies. So quite often they'll end up with um, 110 volt electrical supplies for, for motors. So that needs to be taken into account. The big issue on, on doing work on boats, and, and we've done, we're doing some work on ships at the moment, um, is space. There, there's a real lack of space on, on, on vessels. Um, to get the ducting in and out. Uh, so you tend to have relatively small ducts, which means your volume flow squeezed through a small pipe because you're much higher velocity. Higher velocities get noise, but noise isn't always the big issue on, on ships. It's more the, the kilowatt rating of the motor to overcome those additional pressures you generate for squeezing the air through the pipe. You're also not going to get away with a discharge stack um on ships so you need to be very careful of where you discharge any contaminants so welding bays on ships um what are you going to do with that fume you've captured if you just chuck it out the side of the boat or the back of the boat is it going to come back in through any open windows any like sleeping quarters or, or, or um, areas of where people are going to be gathering so you need to make sure you, you discharge it to a safe place um, yeah, so they are they are a little bit different to, to normal, not not vastly, but usually materials, the voltages of the fan, and and where you're going to discharge the contaminant to. Okay, thank you. Um, another question from me. You mentioned earlier on um, that um, you need to check the competency of the engineers or the people that are coming to test uh, to make sure they're suitably qualified. Is there a document available where the end user or contractors can check um, what competencies are required? Yeah, yeah, there's, um, so uh, the, the HSE a few years back um, pulled together all the key players in the, the LEV industry, everyone who has a, a vested interest put them around a the table and uh, they developed something called the competency matrix. And what that does, that looks at all the various job roles within the LEV industry. And it's identified what learnings and understandings people need to have. And it, it, it cross-references that together with qualifications and various guidance documents. Now that, um, matrix is available for free on the institute of levs website which is www.ilevy.org um, you can go on there you, you put in your, your contact details basically your name and email address uh, just to show that you're a real person and you can download the the matrix for the various job roles you're interested in and you can go back as many times as you want and download as many copies as you want uh, there's no restriction on that um, 
and then you can you can do whatever you want with it. But what that does, that will show you that the what the industry thinks that a, a design engineer or a tester or a service engineer, whatever role that is, or even the end user of the system, what understanding do they need to have and, and where they can go and get that information? And some of it is is qualifications, courses, as you'd expect. Another other bit is is um understanding documents, reading certain documents. Okay, thanks, Adrian. Um, we've, uh, oh, we've just had another question just come in. One second. Yep. Do you have any standard guide to selecting a system for the welding exhaust and vehicle exhaust systems? There's, there's no straightforward standard guide as such. Um, it, it, there are principles uh, we use um but you can't say it's this type of unit the reason being if you think about vehicles first of all vehicles have different size engines each engine will um run at a certain rpm and so if i take a two liter car engine the volume of air that's going to pump out the exhaust is two liters multiplied by its rpm it's being run at and you can convert that into a volume flow and you then take into account the temperature of the, the gas being emitted because the obviously hot air expands so you need to extract that that cloud of gas if you compare that to a truck which might have a four five six liter engine it's going to discharge a lot more air volume and also it might be running at a higher temperature so that the expand expanded cloud will be greater so you have to know what the vehicle is you're working on, what the typical engine size is, and the uh, the RPM they're likely to run it at. So when we look at uh, vehicle repair centers, your um, work bays tend to run at much lower RPM than say an MOT test bed, where they, they rev the engines to, to test it to its capacity. Um, and therefore you get a much more higher emissions and a rolling road will be different again so it all depends on the size of the engine the rpm the typical exhaust gas temperatures and what you're doing with it so that's that's for vehicle exhaust for welding fume you've got lots of different types of welding uh for first of all so there's not one size fits all you depending on the thickness of the rod and, and the amount of um, weld you're putting down uh, will increase the amount of um, fume you will produce so you need to consider that if you're doing static spot welding that's relatively simple because it's not moving but the welder tends to move around um, if you're doing seam welding you will lay a long seam of weld down and whilst we can extract from the, the generation from the source where the weld is actually happening the actual length of weld you've laid down will also continue to gas off for for a considerable period after it's been laid. So you've got to look at multiple um, control options when you're looking at welding. And that's why I said in the, in the presentation, typically for welding, you'd be looking at uh, RPE to protect the welder, because uh, they're the ones who are being exposed to the most. You'd be looking at some form of LEV, that that might be on torch extraction, uh, which the HSC are currently um, liking. It, it has mixed reviews in the real world um but it, it does a job uh, you also have um capture hoods which can work if it's bench mounted you might look for a, a welding bench that will give you a much higher level of control but if you work on long thin tubes or structures like that then you may need uh, dilution ventilation as well as rp and general ventilation because this the fume will travel through the tube and come out of the you know three meters away or however long your piece of tube is uh and you won't have control of that so welding is actually quite complex it's not as straightforward as, as people make out um to provide that adequate control uh so it's not again it's not one size fits all unfortunately um it's a lot of a lot of things to take into account and and the, why are they working how are they working you know uh, 
welding torches on tool extraction welding torches are heavy if the welder is using it all day every day they're probably going to get repetitive strain injury so you've got to consider the ergonomics of these things as well uh, sorry but yeah it's not a one size fits all i'm afraid all right thanks for that adrian um are there, are there any more questions for adrian um nothing coming through so if there are no more questions i'd like to thank adrian for his presentation and we've had a couple thank of thanks come through in the question box. so um thank you very much adrian and thank you everybody for attending and hope it's been useful thanks again thank you bye-bye